We'll cover what we can, and then we may need to do this again and either um, you know, start over and sort of rehash some of the same background stuff or just carry on with new material. Um, I have several folks whose emails were, their questions were so in depth that I'm actually gonna write responses and not do that this morning because their whole class is worth of stuff. You're supposed to be up here. Um, I don't know, Lucy just casually sits down like she's got nothing to do this morning. <laughs> Yeah, hold the mic. <laughs> so we sort of took these in groups, and we're going to start um, back with church history since that was the first thing we did. I got a question that said, were there other powers um, in place before the Protestant Reformation besides the Catholic Church? That answer is yes, sort of, depending on where you mark time. So for the first centuries, hey Jennifer, the first centuries of what we think of as the Christian church and development, the Roman Empire was still in power. Remember back to that first day when we talked about Constantine and the shift from Christians being persecuted to Christians suddenly being not only not persecuted, but the official religion and all of the shift that came with that, including actually some persecution of other groups. So Rome was a seat of power, but in the centuries from the first century, we could mark it sort of close to the death of Christ, some, some years after that, um, two generations after that or so, to 1054, there were groups that were negotiating doctrine. So Lucy did the class on creeds and confessions, and some of the creeds and confessions that we still have in our tradition came out of conflicts in culture and church. So times when the church was facing an internal crisis and needed to figure out what it believed and so wrote a document, usually had a council of people come together and or addressed a cultural crisis around them. So the context drove a need to articulate belief. Around 1054, the churches we think of as West and East split pretty definitively. So that's the, the marker of what we call the Orthodox tradition. So well ahead of the Protestant Reformation in the early 16th century, there were Orthodox seats of power in the Christian church and still the Roman Catholic church as a seat of power. So that's there's a whole lot of complexity about why, but mostly those were doctrinal and authority. That split was mostly about doctrine and authority. Who do we think has authority and what do we think we believe? particularly about the divinity of Christ and how the Trinity works. The Western and Eastern churches did not agree about that. So that's a good, you know, 500 years when there was absolutely an Orthodox church spreading. That was a, a season of great missional activity. Um, people were moving across land masses and planting churches. That wasn't the language, but that's the language we would use. So yes, Rome is the one I focused on in that first class because the Protestant Reformation was focused on the Roman Catholic Church, but there was certainly an Orthodox seat of power. Other church history questions, fascinating, were largely about what happened with Mary, Queen of Scots, Elizabeth I, and John Knox. I, 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 is there anyone here who was a European history major, anyone teach European history? Do you want to take this, Tom? <laughs> he smiles and stays in his seat. <laughs> so that's obviously a really complicated and fascinating season of history, and I don't want to do it short shrift, but I'll, I'll just sort of say it in this way. Um, Mary, Queen of Scots, and John Knox were not friends. <laughs> That's the gentlest way to say that. Did they know to love their enemies? They're working on it. Yeah. yeah. They should have. It was already in the Bible. Um, John Knox objected vociferously to Mary Stuart, Mary Queen of Scots. And looking around at the situation of people in Scotland, he saw poverty and oppression and terrible conditions, and he held the monarchy responsible for that. So a lot of his ire, which was both political and religious, they're not very easy to disentangle, was directed at Mary, Queen of Scots. If she had taken the throne, would there have been a Presbyterian church? That is a fascinating question, and I don't know how to answer that. 
I have to think yes, because the other tentacles of the Protestant Reformation were at work. John Knox was, you know, a generation and a half Below, maybe half a generation below. So he was a student of Calvin and, and knowing Zwingli and working in that same space. And they were already going. So Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, to the extent that they're, they didn't mean to be creating a movement, but the movement they were creating already had roots. So would they have looked the same as sort of the Church of Scotland Presbyterianism took shape? I don't know, but I want someone to write a dissertation on that because it's fascinating to think about. Um, Dom asked the specific question of whether uh, an, a British monarch can be anything but Church of England, can be Catholic now? No, by law, the British monarch has to be Church of England. That's a, a whirlwind through some big church history questions. Are there other history questions before? We're gonna kind of do categories of things. Any others? Great. What do you want to do? I'll do scripture. Perfect. We'll talk about the canon because it, oh, sorry. Yeah. Great. Those are the best ones. So it isn't that, why don't Jews believe in Jesus? Is that the question? <laughs> in two minutes or less. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, interestingly, as I was just talking about the split between the Western and Eastern churches and what we would currently call the Orthodox Church, um, still is the Orthodox Church, which has many branches depending on where it is, uh, a lot of the differences stem from different interpretations of the divinity of Christ. In fact, even within the Christian tradition, there have been multiple points where the heresy that had to be addressed was whether people believed that Jesus was fully divine, was fully man, and the extent to which Jesus is a full part or person of the Trinity. So whether Jesus is in his own right, on the, we could think about it as an org chart, Jesus is on the same level as God versus Jesus is derivative of God, and then how is the Holy Spirit there? Is it an equal person or does it have to travel through the chain to have any authority? The church has been fighting over that for always, basically, since Pentecost. And so some other traditions, deep faith traditions, long, equally long, sometimes longer histories, right? Jews pre-existed, uh, predated Christians. It isn't that they don't believe in history. They interpret it the role of a divine being and who that is differently. And if we think about what's happening in the world today, everyone who's fighting is part of the Abrahamic tradition. I'll just leave that there. Yes. I'm oh. not going to drop it. It's too valuable. I think that's true. So I think that, so kind of going on history in the canon, which I think is in some ways, who's deciding what history to believe we had a question about how is the canon formed, and when I use the language of canon, that means how is the Bible that we read today that's in the pews down in the sanctuary, how do we pick those books versus all the other things that are written? And there's a lot out there that's written. So the quick history there is that there was Old Testament Hebrew, there was a Hebrew Bible, right? There was a Torah that came through. Added on to that were other books, there were probably 24, 26, 24 we decided as Christians, as the Septuagint came together, that we actually were gonna divide up that 24 into 39. So we divided it up into more books. Um, in all, the canon is 66 books. The New Testament is pretty easy. We all, as Christians, believe the New Testament has 27 books in it and we're, we're good with those books. The Old Testament was where it got tricky. And it was about the time of the Reformation those of us in the Protestant world said, well, hang on a second. We're not sure that we think all of these books are ordained by God, that they were all inspired by the Spirit. They had good things to say, but we're not sure that they all had were on the same caliber. So the Protestants said, we're actually going to go back and go more to find our roots, go closer to the Hebrew Bible. And so we went backwards and said, this is actually what we think to be true. At the same time, the Catholic Church, 
It was the Council of Trent, so maybe 50 years later, said, actually, no, we're going to go, and we think all these books that were collected into the Septuagint, we think all of those are scripture. So we sometimes, I don't know if y'all have heard the language of Apocrypha. Those are those middle books. Um, Sometimes big study Bibles will include those. Officially, as Presbyterians, as Protestants, we don't include those as holy scripture, but they have lots for us to read. Martin Luther would say, while they're not holy scripture, they're yet still profitable to read, and we can still learn from them. Our Catholic brothers and sisters see those as full canon. So they would say, no, this is full scripture, and it's an interesting history question because it all falls in that same time, kind of the 1500s of we're dividing off, we're separating out. Uh, And so we, as Protestants, went back to a truer form, that's our language, what we would think was more true to Scripture and the Holy Spirit, and our Catholic brothers and sisters found new things in it. The Apocrypha is fascinating. We don't read it a lot, primarily because there's so much in the Bible that it's hard to get through what's in our canon, but we really could spend a whole year just studying the 14 or 15, depending on how you divide them up of those books in the Apocrypha. Um, Fascinating books that tend to sometimes be very apocalyptic, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, They're way more interesting in some ways because we don't hear them as often, and often they're shorter as well, um, which makes them easier to to read. So that is the Cliff Notes version of the canon. Anything you would add? Well, there's some really... um some interesting stuff in there. So there are accounts of Jesus as a boy getting into lots of mischief, frankly, like playing pranks on people. Um, If you read the book of Thomas, Judith is interesting. Tobit is interesting. These things that um, are not canonical, as Lucy said, because as the canon was being formed, their authenticity and um, the agenda behind their recording gave people pause for whether they should be included in the canon, but they are still informative. So we don't understand them as inspired word, but we do understand them as history documents. I mean, this is something that tells us something about a time in which we didn't live. And they're also intertestamental writings, so things that were recorded in the period between what we know as the Old Testament and the New Testament that scholars and historians absolutely use. So we might not read them as scripture in worship, for example, but they are nonetheless part of our sort of historical development. Gospel of Thomas, we're not going to preach on that. (laughs) Interesting. Oh, what a great question. So... The so question the, is, did women write any of those books? Is the sub-question, is that why they got left out? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of interesting, and I actually don't know. Rebecca will, may know this answer better. There are two books in the Apocrypha, Judith and Susanna, Susanna right? So there's not a lot of books in the Bible that bear women's names. Ruth, Esther. Esther. We get a little bit of press as women, but not a ton. Um, But then there's these two books in the Apocrypha. So it's almost, we pulled two out that had Judith and Susanna. I don't know. It's about them as as prophets, I guess, and priests, but I'm not sure that who wrote them. I don't know who wrote them either, which is interesting. Um, And I'm not sure that any, so what you said, Bonnie, is interesting. Like, did they not even try? Because we're not even going to get in there. But when people were recording everything that we think of as canon, nobody was trying to get published, right? It wasn't like, I'm going to send him a manuscript and my agent's going to call. Yeah, I think that's, that's partly right. So for sure, the, the role of women in the culture is visible in the texts that we've gotten both because of the number of women who have a prominent role to play in scripture and because of how we view that role, right? How time has elevated or not elevated them. Most of the stories that eventually were recorded began as oral stories. And if the people empowered to tell them were male, then that lens also shifts how people see it. So in some ways, it's remarkable. The gospel writers have told us that the first evangelist was Mary. You know, I mean, the most important proclaimer of the resurrection was a woman. And that story probably have been told in a different way that changed our entire understanding of our faith. 
So I assume that there were a whole lot more women doing a whole lot more things than we have. And then some of the ones we get are such powerhouses. I mean, saving the faith, saving a nation, saving a lineage. Esther, whoo, Ruth. I mean, those are brave. Deborah with the tent peg through the... Do y'all know that story about Deborah? We might need to read Judges more. (laughs) Deborah was not to be trifled with. (laughs) She was was a powerful woman. Well, and I think the other thing that's interesting to kind of go on your... So if the Catholic Church had a better... They understand the Apocrypha as more holy. They are better at letting women speak in some ways. They don't have women as priests, but they understand Mary in a way that is lifted up. So for them, the stories of women are in some ways equally as valuable. While they can't be, it's an interesting, that's another study, but they can't be priests, but women have a level of veneration. So to read about Judith and Susanna and all these others wouldn't be as scary for them um, in some ways. Mm -hmm. Could y'all hear Anne's question? Like if we think Jesus was the one sinless person who ever lived, why was he pulling pranks? Yeah, it's a great question, you know, and part of the reason I think that not that the not including that piece of writing in the canon was to make it like seem like this didn't happen and we're going to shove it under the rug. But we also have here a person who was fully human. So you you get in a in a portrayal of a kid, right, you get some sense that, oh, we actually are talking about a kid who had friends and ran around and goodness, scared his parents to pieces when he disappeared for a while because he was in the temple. You know, so um, I, I don't know that there's a whole lot of conversation about whether his mischief is sort of the counterpoint to the sinless life. But of, of certainty, it demonstrates that he was fully human. Um, and maybe it makes us be a little less hard on our kids when they do silly things if Jesus did it and turned out to be the son of man, it might be okay for our kids too. I'm thinking about mischief that we all got into. I'm feeling Don't all right Don't throw anyone myself. off a roof. Yeah. Any other questions about the Apocrypha? We should do a class on the Apocrypha. That would be really interesting. Whew, that's what do you have one. next? I don't remember. We had, oh, predestination. Oh. Do you want to take double predestination? <laughs> We had a lot Thanks. of follow-up questions so, about double predestination. Double predestination is tricky. And we talked, you talked a little bit about it last week, two weeks ago. So double predestination is this idea that we, I'm going to see if I say this correctly. We were all um, have our own free will, but God has already decided who is going to go to heaven and who is going to go to hell. That's the double predestination part. I have a really hard time with double predestination. Um, I don't think that that's, that's not the God that I have experienced. So double predestination is, is one train. If we say predestination and double predestination, it's just a switch in classification. It's that move from double predestination means free will, but God has decided this half is going to heaven and this half is going to hell. I don't think that's the way it works, but that's the, I, I, don't I don't know what know else that to it's say. even numbers. Okay, half and fair. <laughs> It just seemed easy. <laughs> well, um, so ahead, this Lynn. doctrine... Oh, yeah, go ahead, Lynn. Yes, yes and yes. So let's let's take it back to where it started because the questions that we got over the weekend also were saying, well, wait a minute. I understand that we don't believe half of humanity is destined for hell, but what do we believe about salvation, essentially? So de- predestination is a doctrine that was intended to help us understand salvation. Or in the Reformed tradition, we don't use that word that much. We use election is the language. So that God elects to offer eternal life, which is achieved through grace alone, not through any of our doing. God elects people for eternal life. So This goes all the way back to John Calvin, who was looking particularly at the Roman Catholic Church, which has a robust theology of damnation. 
right? He, that was very much a part of the context of his learning and the backdrop to the Protestant Reformation. So John Calvin, trying to reconcile a theology of damnation with a burgeoning emphasis on a God who is omnipotent and gracious and free. So a God who is all-powerful, can extend grace, and can do whatever God wants. John Calvin was trying to make those two things work together. And the way he defined this was to say, well, some people must be predestined for election, and therefore some other people must not be. And he picked a number. And I think, I don't, I don't really understand why, but he picked 144,000 as the number. I, I think it's because he didn't know how big the world was and how many people there were and would be, right? That was... If we think about now, we would never put a number on it because who knows? But he was trying to make sense of what he had known, but also emphasize different attributes of God. And the Presbyterian tradition picked up on this language of predestination, and it has been, frankly, kind of a, a shadow, I think, for a long time because people have heard it as something so negative that it ends up creating fear where the doctrine of election, the fact that we worship a God of grace who is free to save, that's great news. So predestination tends to get a bad rap. Double predestination is not the belief system of the Presbyterian church now. Not. That's good. Yeah. Woo! Everybody exhale. <laughs> Predestination? Oh, gracious. Well, it isn't that we don't want to pay attention. We, it's confusing, right? And, it, and it, you know, when we're, when we're joking at our own expense, we tease about it a lot. It's sort of the thing that Presbyterians get known for. It even kind of sounds like the word Presbyterian, Presbyterian predestination. So we tease about it a lot, which I think makes it sort of mystifying for people, but it really doesn't need to be. I mean, we can unpack it and say, even though there was this one very rigid interpretation, you know, in the early 16th century, since then we've come to understand a lot more about the world and about God and what we're actually hoping looking at the scriptural witness is that our God uses grace to save so we're not living in fear because we're confessing that we're worshiping a God who loves us, right? Loves us so much to make ultimate sacrifice. So predestination gets a bad rap, frankly. Ooh, all the hands went up. Aaron. Yeah, so part of the reason this doctrine even exists was a human anxiety about needing to know everything and define everything. I mean, John Calvin must have been writing out of a place of anxiety because he wrote so much. And whether writing, I mean, the institutes are ridiculous. But, I, ooh, I'm sorry, that's on tape. But... <laughs> read them if you like. But the fact that he wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote did nothing to change God. God is bigger than our understanding. God's choice to grace is beyond our control. That I think is good news. Jim, and then I'll come to Eleanor. Sure. Yeah. I think this is one of those places where our minds want so badly to understand an answer that, you know, we're, and we're working towards something that ultimately is outside our action and time and space as we know it. So yes, if we think God has known us and God's world all along, would we think God would create this and us in order to damn it? Right? Does that make sense? If God has chosen to continue to forgive us, knowing that we are both sinner and forgiven all the time, our free will doesn't become our burden, it becomes our opportunity. Absolutely. Eleanor. Yeah, so. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
This is how we ended up talking about Bonhoeffer a few weeks ago. <laughs> Whoever, who was here for the Bonhoeffer day? Well, I'm happy to say that there's now Bonhoeffer in our library. Yes, didn't know it wasn't there before, but it's there now. So this idea that we have free will, this is actually one of the main parts of Bonhoeffer's theology. So Bonhoeffer was um, a clergy person who ended up on the wrong side of the Nazi government. And he was making pretty powerful statements about discipleship in the face of horrors, right? The world was visibly horrible um, as people were killing each other. And he talks a lot about how our free will is not licensed to do whatever we want. So if we were to say, doesn't matter, I'm forgiven, I can do this because I'll be forgiven, right? That that actually cheapens and devalues grace. So he, uh, he frames that exact point, I guess, knowing that humans are depraved and will say, cool, I have license to do horrible things and still have forgiveness. He says, no, if you're going to count on grace and mercy, you have to honor the value of that grace and mercy with your life, how you live, in other words. So do not go do things because you can, terrible things because you can, because that makes grace cheap. And there, to use his language, there is a cost associated with discipleship. It is the cost in how we live, and we believe it is the cost of Jesus's life, right? We follow a God who took on our sin, right, so that we could enjoy forgiveness. But that doesn't mean go do whatever you want. Kathy. Kathy. Hmm. Yes, and I would say forgiveness plus. How do you define it? I think grace is God's forgiveness and God's love. And, and God's, in some ways for me, salvation ties up into grace for me. So there, we could talk about salvation separately, but grace is that huge encompassing word that is the forgiveness because God loves us and with the forgiveness and God's love, we are saved. So I pull all three together. Agreed. And, and I would say it's a continuum of things. So I think often about... Um, you all remember when Brian Stevenson was here last year and how Brian Stevenson talks regularly about how none of us should be judged for the worst moment in our lives, the single worst choice or the biggest mistake we made. So grace is sort of that replenishment over our whole lives that says God does not pick a moment and says, well, this is you and this is all you get to be and I'm going to judge you based on this. It's this renewing sense of love and forgiveness and wanting our well-being that are all rolled into one, one word. Which is, I think, why if we go through our worship, it's why that confession part is so important in the Presbyterian liturgy. We always do the prayer of confession together, and then we always have that assurance at the end. That's perhaps one of the most important parts, that we are insured of God's grace over and over and over again because it's always replenishing. Yeah. Question. I, ha I think there were other hands. Tom. I know y'all couldn't hear that. That was a complicated question. I'm not sure I can reframe it, Tom. So Tom's talking about a David Bentley Hart book called All Shall Be Saved. That's really, that's really thinking through the imagery and consequence for notions of hell and purgatory and salvation as they get rolled together. Um, and we did have a follow-up question about hell, which is interesting. So hell, as I said the week we did that very fast, most of the imagery we associate with hell is extra biblical. It's actually not what we see in the biblical text. There are some images, there's the lake of fire in Revelation that have that sort of fiery. There is sort of an outer darkness idea that's in the Bible. But more than that, most of what we understand as the thing we don't want, whatever name that is for eternity, is separation from God. It's more relational than it is punitive or physical place. So mostly in the Middle Ages, the imagery was adopted that we see now. You know, if y'all saw my slides that day, I just Googled put up some of the images that were there and they were all what you would think, right? I mean, what do y'all associate with the word? What imagery? Fire. What'd you say, Sally? Brimstone. Yes, yes. Torture. Ooh, 
Where is it? Under. It's down. Where? Like, you know, when we push for even that long, we get to a thing that says, really? Does that make sense? Is everyone going to the center of the earth? You know, it's not, it's not so much about those images, but those images were fearsome, right? Those changed people's lives, and the threat of that was a very strong motivator. I mean, many people's faith journey was with this sort of threat of damnation behind them all the time. And we can take seriously the call that we do not want to be separated from God without living in permanent fear and anxiety and thinking that we're going to have someone scream at us in brimstone. And that's the sort of shift in some of the, um, as the Protestant Reformation was taking shape and then had various later iterations, that's theology that changed. Purgatory and hell are really not prominent in the biblical text. There is um, what is really called Sheol in the Bible, which is not purgatory, but it's sort of what we think of as the closest thing to purgatory. In the ancient world, people understood that when you died, really nothing happened. There wasn't something after that. You went to Sheol, and Sheol we think of as bad because we see everything through the lens of imagery that's come since the Middle Ages. But Sheol wasn't bad. It was just there. It was just death. And that has been reinterpreted with various layers. And depending on the um, interpretive lens, some of those are a continuum, right? If you think about Dante, or if you think about the sort of vertical notions of purgatory and hell, in some traditions, you descend to purgatory, and, and what happens in purgatory? You wait. You wait, you make amends, you repent, you hope, to ride the elevator up, but if you're not good enough, you're gonna ride the elevator down. And that's actually not biblical at all, that notion. I do think hell is also interesting in the Apostles' Creed, which is perhaps when we talk about it the most, because we say that he descended into hell, and then the third day he rose again from the dead. And there was a point for me when I would never say that line, and we were all saying it all together, and I quit talking, because I was like, oh, I don't believe that line, the descending into hell part. I changed my mind on that, because there's this beauty in Jesus descended into hell so that there was no more separation, it, breaking free the gates so that anything that might have held us down and separated us from God, Jesus took that away. Um, so that's, for me, when we talk about hell, I always think about the Apostles' Creed really more than scripture. Um, so, oh, we have lots of questions. Yeah. It's tricky. <laughs> yeah, I like to think we're good with most of it. I, you know, our confessions, I think it's tricky because we always go to scripture first. Time for church. Um, okay, I'll be, well, two minutes and I'll be there too. I, I think with, script, with confessions, we say we believe them. It's part of our constitution as Presbyterians. But as Christians, that's not part of what we're saying we believe. So I think that the confessions are stories that walk us through history and teach us things and are a way for us to explain some of what we might see in scripture. But the important part with confessions is always to know how do we understand confessions? We always go back to scripture. So we don't all have to think and believe all of the confessions that are written. Because really, if we read them, there's a lot of things that I would not believe at all. Um, there's some things that we would not want to read in front of our children. Um, there, it's, there's some harshness in some of the middle ones. They, they were tough. So I think what we're saying is that we have this book to look to as guidance, but that is not scripture for us. So it doesn't have to be an authority. It is a, a resource, a tool. Um, we affirm these things. We affirm our faith. In the 11 o'clock service, we often have the affirmation of faith. Uh, and and we are picking portions because we can't do the whole book of confessions, but you will notice that there's, there's parts that we never read. We don't often read from the Scots Confession or the Second Helvetic Confession um, very often because those maybe are slightly more problematic. 
they're also just not very digestible. Um, so go ahead. We have had 30 seconds. Yeah. So the question is, what do we think about heaven and hell in our daily experience? I think that this is a pretty personal question. I think the way you might live and describe hell is different how you might describe it versus me. And the book that Tom mentioned, there's a little bit more definition behind what hell means. I often think about hell as scripture or uh, separation and hell as loneliness. And so I think that there are moments in all of our lives when we are truly in places that seem like hell and there is not another way to describe it. Um, that there are places when we feel so separated from our community, from our loved ones, from God, that we don't know how to describe it except for to say, this must be hell. And if we go back to scripture and we look at the Psalms in particular, those Psalms, I mean, they say that. They are over and over again lamenting, God, you seem so far. God, why aren't you here? God, why haven't you stepped in? Then the very next one is... God, you are the greatest. God, you have given us the earth. You know the hairs on our head. So I think that there is a heaven and hell in all of our daily lives. And when we go back to scripture, we can actually see that that, that may be really true to our faith. So the last thing I know we never talked about is apocalyptic literature. So it's not because we're afraid of it. I really love apocalyptic literature. Um, and there's some good stuff there. We'll talk more about it another day. But one of the big questions around apocalyptic literature, and in our understanding, that's Revelation and Daniel are the big ones, but there are pieces of apocalyptic literature in other books of the Bible, prophets, Joel, Zechariah, a little bit in the Gospels even, Thessalonians. The apocalyptic literature is all about something being revealed, something that was hidden that is new. So the very quick line on apocalyptic literature is, there is a time when there seems to be no hope in the present and someone is trying to unveil this future hope, this future good. And almost always, apocalyptic literature is written in symbols. It's a symbolic piece. So as we're going through Revelation in particular, if we talked about, well, why are there seven scrolls? Here's why there might be seven. Why are there great beasts? Who's the wild beast? There may not actually be a wild beast or a dragon, but what is that representative of? How do we use symbols to help describe those things which we haven't yet seen or we don't know how to describe here and now? And then the other part is that in particular with Daniel and Revelation, there were these powers, these empires, who if you said, I believe that Jesus is Lord or that God is the one true God, you would be killed. But if you used other language, then perhaps the empire, the, the guys in charge, would not come kill you. So sometimes that apocalyptic literature is there. It's sub suburban, suburban, I can't say the word, but it's, it's secretive, right? It's coming in just enough to make sure other people can know what's happening, but that empire may not. Um, but the apocalyptic literature is great. There's lots of it, and we should read more of it. We read Revelation more than you think, but not some of the good, fun stories about the dragons and the beasts. I, often at funerals we, or memorial services, we read Revelation. Um, and Daniel's great, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The other half of that is some crazy apocalyptic stuff. Um, so it's good stuff happening there. I'm going to close this because I have to go put my robe on. But I think this has been great. One of the things Rebecca and I've realized is that we may need to do this again and have Presbyterianism 101 second semester or 201 or whatever Bonnie says. Thank you, guys.